first, I'm really thrilled to be here uh, sharing my story on the patient story. Uh, my hobbies, let's see, I'm an avid cyclist. I, I actually use cycling um, as a fundraising tool for our lung cancer community. I am an artist. I have a studio, an art studio in my home. Very active being outdoors. I like to write, read, art, and cycle. So that's the most interesting part of my story. I never had symptoms. I, my lung cancer was discovered through an incidental pulmonary nodule found in the emergency room. They went into the um, emergency room being urged by my primary care physician because I was feeling pressure in my chest. Um, turned out my heart was absolutely fine. I was just a little stressed at work. And uh, it turns out they found a nodule in my right lung. So they ended up watching it for a couple of years. Every six months, it was a follow-up program. Now, more formally, because that was... 18 years ago. So more formally, it's called an IPN management program, an incidental pulmonary nodule management program that a lot of hospitals have. Um, not all. I think every hospital needs a good IPN management program, um, living proof of that. Um, so we watched it for a couple of years. And then when it changed, I was sent to a thoracic surgeon who was going to biopsy at what was on the table while I was on the table. And it turns out it was malignant. So they removed the lower or right lobe of my lung during that surgery. They removed a portion of my lung, the lobe, lower right lobe, um, when I was 44 years old. So that was um, 18 years ago. They watched it for two full years. You know, I knew nothing about lung cancer then. So I... Honestly, everybody kept saying, we think it's something you were born with. It hadn't changed. Every time I went, it was stable. So I actually didn't think about it during those two years. And now it's always in the back of my mind 18 years later, because um, I know we'll get to this part of the story later. But since then, I have been diagnosed a total of three times over many years of being stable. So it's always in the back of my mind now. Then it wasn't. Once that they removed the the lobe that had the cancer, the following year, they found something in my upper right lung. Um, so back to surgery, I went. The good news is that turned out to be scar tissue from the first surgery. So that was benign. So then I was watched every six months for five years and then annually from then on. So I was no evidence of disease for 11 years in between my first lung cancer diagnosis and my second lung cancer diagnosis. And that's an important part of the story too, because typically at around the 10 year mark, you're thinking you're in the clear, um, but uh, I wasn't. But since that, my first diagnosis, a year after my first diagnosis, my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer the exact same way. Um, she went to the emergency room thinking she was having a heart attack. And it turns out that she had stage three lung cancer. So, so I've had lung cancer three times. I was the very first one in my family diagnosed. Six of us in my family have been diagnosed with lung cancer. Two of us were diagnosed early. Two of us survived the disease. Something that was surprising to me is I thought it was automatically done. Now I asked for it. Um, if, if you're at a point where you're going to have <clears throat> the tumor or a nodule biopsied, it's, I, it's always important to make sure you ask the question, are you taking enough tissue to do biomarker testing? Because <clears throat> if you can find out, if it has a, a mutation, there might be a better first line treatment for your particular type of lung cancer. And I made an assumption that all facilities were just automatically doing this testing and they're not. So I would definitely uh, suggest that all patients ask for that and actually demand it because it, it could be life-changing if you have a particular marker that can be treated a certain way. Again, because I was in a... Um, 
management program watching my lungs, um, we discovered the second time early as well, I went, uh, my pulmonologist left clinical medicine and I had to find a new pulmonologist. So we are lucky to have Penn Medicine in our backyard. I live outside of Philadelphia and my uncle was going to a pulmonologist there. So he suggested his pulmonologist and I went. And at that point I was on x-rays, uh, annual x-rays. And he said, I can't really see anything on an x-ray. Go get a CAT scan, come back, and we'll probably just do annual screenings. So I got a CAT scan, went in for my appointment, and that's when he told me I had lung cancer for the second time. So the interesting about that thing about that particular diagnosis is that the only surgical option because of where it was located, it was in my right lung, but I've already had now two surgeries in my right lung. Um, it was small and based on where it was located, the surgeon told me the only surgical option was to remove my entire lung. And the tumor was pretty small. So clearly we didn't want that to happen. So I met with radiation oncology and they were at, able to treat me with SBRT, which is like a targeted radiation and a, and a pretty much obliterate the nodule. Um, so that was my second lung cancer diagnosis. The, the interesting thing about that is that treatment was not available when I was first diagnosed to me or my mother because they weren't doing SBRT on a moving organ. You could have it targeted radiation on your brain, but you couldn't have targeted radiation on your on your lungs because they're a moving organ. But since that, the um, advances in treatment, I was able to have that. And I like to tell the story just to show the difference in treatment options. My first surgeries were so difficult. I was in the hospital for over a week each time, chest tubes, very painful, months of recovery, um, thoracotomies, it was hard. Radiation, my third day of treatment, I went for a 20 mile bike ride. 10 days after my treatment was over, I was exhausted and spent about two days in bed. That was the only side effect I had from radiation. So I was, I have been so lucky um, in my cancer journey because my first one was diagnosed early. We've been watching it. So therefore every diagnosis I have has been at an early stage. After about um, six months follow-up, they found um, a cloudy spot on one of the vertebrae in my spine. So at that point I was following up with my pulmonologist. They sent me to medical oncology because we weren't sure if it was damage or metastases. So that's when I switched over to medical oncology. I'm grateful to say that um, it was well, not grateful, but I'm happy to say it wasn't metastases, it was damage from radiation. But then about six months, eight months after that, I suffered an embolic stroke. Um, and nobody really knows why I had a stroke other than it could have been related to my cancer diagnosis because a blood clot shut down my internal right carotid artery. So it took me probably eight months to recover from my stroke. And then, so from then I was stable and no evidence of disease and healthy, um, being followed up every six months for two and a half years. And then they discovered something else and I was switched to every three months until my diagnosis, my third lung cancer diagnosis, which was just two years ago. And two years ago, I they found a tumor in my left lung, which was my good lung. I was getting low dose CT scans every three months. That's the well, and then when they discover something they're unsure of, then I also get a PET CT to see if anything lights up to for the likelihood of it being malignant. So they saw something suspicious, um, which means that a solid 
uh, nodule that wasn't there before, that's speculated, that is growing over time. Um, at first, we wanted to watch it because sometimes the treatment or the biopsy is harder on your body <laughs> at it, until we know exactly, and it becomes to the point we're pretty sure this needs attention. So that's what we did. We watched it until it got to the point was, okay, this has changed, it's grown, it needs attention. So that's when I met with a surgical, um, um, a thoracic surgeon. And this is where I went and I met with all the different doctors. And then I came back to my pulmonologist to make a final decision. Because quite frankly, Alexis, I didn't want surgery. I had an awful experience with my first two surgeries all those years ago, and I wanted radiation. So <clears throat> even when I met with my radiation oncologist, he said, look, you're strong and healthy. Surgery really is your best option. But if you want me to radiate this, I can get it. It's your choice. And I asked him one question that changed my mind. Said to him, if I go with radiation, is it possible that that will hinder treatment down the road should I have a fourth diagnosis? And he said, it's possible. It's possible that if we, if you go with radiation, you won't be able to have surgery down the road because of the damage radiation will do to your lung. And that is all I needed to hear. Uh, the surgeon felt confident that he could get it and that the surgery would be easier. It could be done through that instead of a full thoracotomy. So I chose surgery. The interesting thing about that is my surgeon was a principal investigator in a study called Tumor Glow. And he said, well, I have this study. Uh, I don't know that it will really help you, but you can be in the study and it, we, it, it was an imaging agent, a study for an imaging agent. So they, they inject you with a dye, a fluorescent dye the night before your surgery. And it was a randomized phase three trial. And he said, so we don't know if you'll get it or not. I locate the tumor in the operating room, then they open the envelope. And if you get the study, then we can use the special camera that allows the tumor to glow and we cut it out. So I said, I'm in, please sign me up. I qualify and I, I'm kind of a total um, lung cancer science geek now because of all the advocacy work I've done. So I wanted to do it. So I woke up from surgery and I said to them, did I get the special envelope? <laughs> and they said, not only did you get the special envelope, a second tumor glow that didn't show up on any of your scans. There was a second tumor, pathology showed that both tumors were, were malignant. And because my doctor knows who I am and knows how active I am, he said, because of the, this imaging agent, he took out as little lung as he needed to with clean margins. And I went right back into my world after I recovered from my surgery and am still able to cycle and be active and do all the things that I love to do. That imaging agent was just FDA approved for lung cancer in December. So it felt amazing to participate in that, that it helped me personally, and that now it can help all these other patients. I have a picture of my glowing tumors that are no longer in my lungs. And from that, we took, um, my best friend knows that how much I love beautiful things. And I sent her that image and she sent back all of these altered images of that surrounding it. We we titled it Beauty and the Beast. And I now have it as a piece of artwork. This was an easy decision to make for me because it was it was about it was it was enhancing a treatment that we knew or we felt confident was going to be successful. I think that clinical studies and clinical trials, not only in this particular situation, not only did it benefit me, and I really didn't think there would be any benefit 
to me other than maybe assisting the surgeon. But the fact that it could help other patients is what was most appealing to me. The fact that it was taking science to another level was appealing to me. We desperately need advances. We desperately need advances in the lung cancer space. And if I can do something to help those advances, then I'm happy to do it. I have a I have an amazing medical team. My pulmonologist still, even my medical team consists of a interventional pulmonologist, a medical oncologist, a thoracic surgeon, and a radiation oncologist. Um, because of my family history, even though I'm an early stage patient, I'm not a typical early stage patient because I my body seems to keep producing malignant uh, tumors in my lungs. So I go I I go to my pulmonologist and from there we talk about when something is discovered, we talk about treatment options. So even though I'm followed by my medical oncologist, when we discover something, I usually meet with my interventional pulmonologist because he helps me weigh out the best treatment option. Is it radiation? Is it surgeon surgery? You know, I'm the type of patient that likes to really understand what's going on. I ask a lot of questions. I want to understand the treatment options so I can make an educated decision. So I encourage other patients to ask as many questions uh, as they want to make sure they understand because no one is going to be more invested in your lungs than you are. They can be invested in it. They can be the most amazing doctors, but it's still your lungs. It's still your body. That's what I want to encourage other patients to do. If the doctor tells you to follow up, follow up. Take it into your own hands. Make those appointments and make sure that you follow the schedule because early stage lung cancer can look like this. Early stage lung cancer can look like riding your bike 400 miles on a, over five days for a charity ride. You know, early detection saves lives. I just want to tell people that knowing can save your life. Not knowing can make the journey so much harder. So I implore people to um, break through that, that fear and follow up and stay on top of it. Something else I try to do is to make sure my doctors know who I am. So they all know I'm an avid cyclist. They all know I'm fairly athletic. They all know my personality, that I'm optimistic, that I protect the joyful things in my life. They know who I am. And that benefited me. That benefits me, I think, because then when they're treating me, they know better what my goals are. I was just released to the six month mark. I had COVID in January. Well, no, sorry. I had COVID in August and had some lung damage from COVID. So was put back onto a three month follow up because we weren't exactly sure what was going on. So I was just released back to six months. So I'm on a six month follow up and we'll probably stay there for a couple of years as long as everything stays stable. So I'm considering no evidence of disease right now. It's still very stressful and weary. It's always in the back of my mind. It never leaves. Um, you know, and scans, we, in, as I'm sure you're aware, in the cancer community, we fondly refer to it as scanxiety. <laughs> you know, you get your scan, and then you have to wait to find the results. And typically, I'm fine, but I've been blindsided a couple of times where I'm walked in thinking everything was going to be fine just to find out it's not. So it, that never leaves you. What I try and focus on during those times though, is that there is nothing I can do until I know there is an actionable item, something that needs action. I'm not gonna waste the precious time I have 
worrying about it. It can be in the back of my mind and I can acknowledge it, but I don't have to allow it to be all consuming. I can continue to live my life, live my happy, beautiful, blessed life and worry about it when I have something to worry about and when there's something that I need to take action on. Otherwise, I try and put it in the back of my mind and just go live my life and be happy. Exercise helps me clear my head. So yes, that helps a lot. I've done a lot of work on being present um, with everything that has happened in my family. I, I've, I've done a lot of internal work. I've done a lot of reading and, and being present and trying to bring myself into the present moment is what helps me. And I get really involved in fundraising in legislative policy, so some of the le legislative work we're doing is asking for an increase in federal funding. So lung cancer kills more people than any other cancer, period. As women, we have a greater chance of dying from lung cancer than from breast cancer. So we, uh, lung cancer, I say we, the community um, receives the least amount of federal funding or a lower amount than other cancers. So we go to Washington as a community and ask our representatives to support an increase in the lung cancer research program. For newly diagnosed patients, it can be really overwhelming. Um, I didn't know what I know now when I was first diagnosed. I went on the internet and even though I was in early stage, Anything you saw about lung cancer was really pretty discouraging. We have a lot of advocacy groups. We have um, not only overall lung cancer advocacy groups, we have advocacy, advocacy groups that are um, geared towards certain mutations. So lately I have spoken to a lot of newly diagnosed patients and I've connected them with other patients in a similar situation. So with my survivorship comes a profound sense of responsibility to do something, to make a difference, to do something with my family's journey so that it can help other people, so that it can help the next generation of my family, potentially. So they're not here, but I am. And I'm here for a reason. And I want to do something meaningful with this gift of my life. And I've, I found it through this. <laughs>